Have you ever dreamed of starting your own podcast? Well, you can. It's simple, it's easy, and best of all, it's free. By going to anchor.fm, you can start your own podcast today and have your own show up and ready to go. Anchor's graphic user interface is user friendly and you get paid for your content by setting up a Stripe account. Go to anchor.fm. Again, that's anchor.fm and start your podcast today. Welcome to the Living Healthy Podcast, where you can improve your quality of life by making solid and informed decisions. I'm your host, Eddie Randall. Thank you for tuning in to the Living Healthy Podcast. I have another terrific show lined up tonight. Tonight I'll be talking about sugar and diabetes. Tonight's podcast is entitled, The Truth Behind Sugar and Diabetes and Ways to Avoid Them. Sugar is everywhere, and for good reason. It tastes great. However, all things, especially sugar, should be consumed in moderation. Sugar naturally occurs in foods. This is why there is no daily nutritional recommendation for sugar. Unfortunately, a lot of processed foods have added sugar to make them more appealing. This is bad for the waistline and overall health as excess sugar can lead to weight gain, resulting in undue stress on the joints, back pain, and diabetes. This is an important reason why processed foods should be eaten in moderation or not at all. Aside from that, sugar can also be used to bolster texture and it can even act as a preservative in foods. Sugar, just like salt, can enhance flavor and is very, very addictive. Manufacturers know this and it is no secret as to why they add sugar unnecessarily to foods. Eating food releases endorphins like dopamine and serotonin. These neurotransmitters are responsible for inducing pleasure and relaxation. This is where the term comfort food comes from. Serotonin and dopamine occur naturally in the body. Serotonin makes you relax and feel good. It also plays a key role in sleeping and digestion. Dopamine makes you feel good as well, but it's more associated with reward and expectation. When sugar is consumed, dopamine makes you experience pleasure and excitement. To show you how intrinsic and influential these neurotransmitters are on the body, many mental illnesses such as schizophrenia are believed to be caused by an imbalance of one or both of these neurotransmitters. When you eat something salty, you naturally want to eat something sweet and vice versa. This is why soft drinks are sold with fast food hamburgers, chicken, pizza, etc. Water could uh, be sold just as easily, but there would not be as much profit, as companies can charge more for soft drinks juxtaposed to water, and they also want customers to associate feelings of pleasure with their food products. What better way to do that than by adding feel-good inducing sugar to food products and also selling them outright in the form of soft drinks? I don't want to make it seem like we're being forced into seeking pleasure through sugar. Our bodies are naturally wired that way. There are small bumps on the tongue called papillae. These are receptors that have the function of taste. Taste buds are located inside of the papillae. When we taste something, it sends communications to the brain so we can interpret what we are tasting. There is a brain reward pathway called the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. There are three other pathways, but for simplicity and relevance to the podcast, I will only mention the one. This is the same pathway believed to be the cause of some mental disorders. Also, this same pathway plays a role in addiction, i.e. drugs, gambling, alcoholism, sex, etc. This pathway contains the ventral tegmental area, and it's located in the midbrain and contains dopamine cells. It communicates with another part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is in the forebrain. This is where feelings of pleasure and reward are initiated. 
Examples of such feelings involve sex, drugs, accomplishment, food, and in this particular case, the pleasurable feeling after consuming sugar. When sugar is consumed, the mesolimbic dopamine pathway releases dopamine, resulting in relaxation, comfort, and pleasure. Memories are made connecting the surroundings, the pleasurable, rewarding feeling, all centered around the food that was consumed. There's an article written by De Jong, Van der Schren, and Edan called The Mesolimbic System and Eating Addiction, What Sugar Does and Does Not Do. Their review stated that the glucose that was given to rats influenced the mesolimbic dopamine system and builds stimulus reward associations. The CDC states that over 70% of Americans are overweight. That, coupled with sugar being added to foods by manufacturers where there's no true nutritional advantage, it is no wonder that the weight gained bolsters obesity and heart disease in the United States. Sugar has undoubtedly caused the average BMI to increase. BMI is your body mass index, which essentially measures your fat. It is your weight in kilograms divided by your height squared in meters. Looking at your BMI is essential in weight loss, and it is commensurate with blood glucose levels. As your BMI increases, so does insulin resistance, resulting in diabetes. This all ties into sugar, as excess sugar can add unnecessary calories to your diet, increasing weight gain and BMI. If you want to avoid excess sugar, the number one thing to do is to avoid processed foods. These processed foods include fast food, candy, cakes, donuts, ice cream, soft drinks, energy drinks, and sugary juice drinks. There are two things to do. One is to eat natural sugar, and two, to limit sugar altogether, natural or not. On nhsgo.uk, their website has an article entitled, Top Sources of Sugar Added in Our Diet. They quote dietitian Catherine Collins as stating that there's no such thing as a healthy sugar, even if it's unrefined, honey, brown, etc. This does make sense. Uh, some years ago, a doctor, I forgot his name, he was stating that he had many patients who tried to eat healthy and they ate lots of fruits and turned away from junk food. He said that unfortunately, some of those patients ate so much fruit that they ended up becoming diabetic. So this makes sense as to what Catherine Collins is talking about. Uh, sugar is added to foods in excess such as breads, spaghetti sauce, ketchup, crackers, salad dressings, canned soup, and oatmeal. Sugars may also be hidden in plain sight. This is why it's very important to read your labels. Anything ending in os is a sugar. For example, glucose, dextrose, maltose, sucrose, fructose, and lactose. If you see high fructose corn syrup, please avoid that at all costs. Have a glass of water instead of a sugary drink, and when having that cup of coffee to get the morning going, try to have it without sugar, as well as that cup of tea to unwind after a long day. It's difficult, but it is a habit that can be developed and followed. Make sure you calorie count and check your labels for daily amount of sugar content. The daily amount listed is not a nutritional recommendation. It is an advisory. On TakeControlOfYourDiabetes.org, there's an article by Dana Palmero called 36 Hidden Names for Added Sugar. She states that if the label says that a serving has 5% of the daily recommended amount, then that's good. If a serving is more than 20% of the daily recommended amount, then that is high. The American Heart Association says that men should consume 36 grams of sugar per day, which is 9 tablespoons, and women should consume 24 grams of sugar a day, which is 6 tablespoons. The role sugar plays in our body. As I stated earlier, when it comes to sugar, our brains are wired to associate sugar with pleasure and comfort as neurotransmitters are released causing these feelings. 
Sugar, however, does play a very important role in our cell processes. We need sugar to create energy so cells can function. When we take in carbohydrates like sugar, our bodies convert it to glucose in the blood. Once glucose is in the blood, the pancreas secretes, secretes the hormone insulin. Insulin helps to regulate blood glucose levels. If there is any excess glucose left that cells do not need at the moment, it is stored. This is how weight gain happens when we consume too much. There are natural sugars in food as the excess that is added is what causes so many people to gain weight and eventually become diabetic. The process of energy conversion from carbohydrates like sugar works like this. When carbs are broken down into glucose, glycolysis converts glucose into pyruvate. Two ADPs are used. ADP is adenosine triphosphate. This is where two phosphates are attached to the sugar, making it fructose 1,6 bisphosphate. Phosphofructokinase is the enzyme that causes this reaction. This is highly unstable, so it breaks down into two sugars. This reaction happens twice, once for each sugar, creating two ATPs, adenosine triphosphate, and one NADH, which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. They are carrier molecules. Pyruvate is a carrier molecule. It's made and then it enters into the mitochondria. What this boils down to is that glucose is turned into two, three carbon molecules called pyruvate, two molecules of ADP, two molecules of ATP, and two NADH are gained for each glucose molecule that's broken down. There are many other processes involved, like the Krebs cycle and the citric acid cycle, but for simplicity, I'm going to only mention uh, basic glycolysis. ATP is vital as it is the energy that is needed to drive cellular functions such as communication and transportation. In addition, it's used as a coenzyme to create DNA. If there is any indication of how important ATP is, that is the clear reason right there. On a cellular level, it's essentially the fuel for our gas tanks. On the NCBI website, there's an article by Dunn and Greider called Physiology Adenosine Triphosphate. They state that ATP serves a broad range of functions including DNA and RNA synthesis, cell signaling, transportation, and muscle contraction. Now that we understand that we are predisposed to liking sugar and sugary foods and how sugar helps to fuel cellular processes, I will dive a little further, but briefly, into the psychology behind it. Why we crave sugar. I had spoken about dopamine and the reward system tied in with memories and pleasurable feelings that make sugar addictive. Foods can have an effect on addiction in the same way as with prescription and illicit drugs. On frontiersinpsychiatry.org, there's an article by Wiss, Avina, and Rada called Sugar Addiction from Evolution to Revolution. They state that food and drugs as positive reinforcement have the same effect as addictive behavior. They conducted an animal study and found that rats given sugar reacted the same when given amphetamines, and rats given amphetamines reacted the same way when given sugar. This proved that sugar can cause behavior similarly found in drug addiction. Corporations know this and have studied this and aim to deliver products that taste good and have the propensity to be addictive. Aside from being used as a preservative, excess sugar, as I stated earlier, is put into products. I remember taking care of patients and I was amazed how many are diabetic. They weren't all necessarily overweight or anything, and not all of them had type 1 diabetes from childhood either. As time went on, I learned that the excess weight gained and eating habits can hurt the pancreas and cause detrimental spikes in blood glucose levels. Unless people are actively reading labels to look for hidden sugars and making water the primary drink of choice with and without meals, we are overwhelming our bodies and organs with unnecessary sugar. In our society and the world we live in, it almost seems taboo to have a meal without a soft drink or some type of sugary juice drink. 
There are aisles full of soft drinks and sugary juice drinks, and billions have been spent in research, production, marketing, and advertising, all in the name of a profit. I'm not saying that these corporations are evil or misleading. They're not. The majority of them, if not all of them, are working within the FDA guidelines and producing quality products. The thing is, as a consumer, you need to be aware of what you are consuming by paying attention to labels and watching your sugar intake. If people cared as much about their sugar intake as they do with their credit score, we would have a healthier society. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm in this too. I am just like you. I am definitely going to pay attention or more attention uh, to alternate names for sugar on food labels moving forward. Diabetes and Sugar there is a misconception that eating too much candy, cakes, or sweets can cause diabetes. This is not true. Consuming sugar does not directly cause diabetes. Eating too much sugar can cause you to gain weight, which can lead to diabetes. However, consuming too much of any kind of food can cause weight gain, leading to diabetes. Diabetes, or diabetes mellitus, comes in a few types. Diabetes type 1, which is the type common to children. This is an autoimmune disorder where the pancreas does not work. The immune system attacks the pancreas, not allowing insulin to be produced. Type 2 is the more common type and which often affects adults. This is where the body becomes resistant to insulin. This comes from eating too much and or too often. The glucose accumulates in the blood but does not get processed so the sugar can damage blood vessels and organs. This is a widespread disease with tumultuous effects on health. Fortunately, diabetes is very preventable. Unfortunately, the CDC states that one out of every 10 Americans has diabetes. There is prediabetes where people that are overweight and their lack of diet change or physical activity puts them at a risk to develop diabetes later on. Simply eating less, losing weight, and becoming more active can prevent you from becoming pre-diabetic. The CDC states that one out of every three Americans is pre-diabetic, and they don't know it. Gestational diabetes. This happens later on in pregnancy and is more common in overweight women. Pregnancy is a beautiful and natural thing. However, it takes a drastic toll on a woman's health. People sometimes say that when a woman gives birth, it's the closest thing to her dying. This is just referring to the uh, hormonal stress, strain, and pressure on the body during this event. I would advise that if a woman plans to get pregnant, and she's overweight to please lose weight first and get her body in a better position to prevent gestational diabetes. Diabetes is a hormonal disease that can be exacerbated by many things such as heart disease, kidney disease, and high blood pressure. Also, many ailments can contribute to a person developing diabetes. For example, a person with a heart condition unable to exercise, a sedentary lifestyle, with little to no exercise or cardiac exercise may lead to diabetes. Cancer can even play a role. In my time in healthcare, I've had a patient or two that developed diabetes from chemo treatment. Your doctor can order a hemoglobin A1C test. This test checks for diabetes or pre-diabetic markers in your blood. The CDC lists a normal A1C of 5.7 and below. Prediabetes is 5.7 to 6.4, and someone who is diabetic is 6.5 and above. Diabetes compromises your health and puts you at risk for developing other health issues, and not to mention the cost of diabetes and supplies to maintain the condition. All that can be avoided, aside from type 1 diabetes and in some cases gestational diabetes, by making healthier lifestyle diet choices exercising, staying active, and reading the labels to make sure you do not overconsume sugar. Again, sugar has no direct correlation to diabetes. It is the weight gain that can cause the condition. The fat cells and or excess visceral adipose tissue, which is the natural layer of fat covering abdominal organs, can grow and get bigger when fat is stored. It happens as we naturally get older. 
On men, it's often called a belly or beer gut. On women, it's often called a pouch. The fat cells are more resistant to insulin than muscle cells are. Al Gablan, Al Alfai, and Zahn have an article on the U.S. National Library of Medicine's website. The article is called Mechanism Linking Diabetes, Mellitus, and Obesity. They state that being overweight leads to insulin resistance and increased fatty acids in the blood, causing decreased glucose transport into muscle cells. As with your A1C, your BMI can be an indicator of your risk for diabetes. However, BMI is different for athletes, meaning they would weigh more but have a leaner fat content due to increased muscle and bone mass. When you build stronger muscle, it gets heavier, and the bones also get heavier in order to hold up those stronger muscles. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for supporting the podcast. The Living Healthy Podcast is listed on many platforms, including Anchor, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Bullhorn, and many others. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And don't forget to check out the Living Healthy Podcast channel on YouTube. Also, if you have any questions or would like me to discuss a particular topic, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please contact me at livinghealthylivinghealthy at gmail.com. Cancer and Sugar What it really means. There's a misconception that eating sugar can cause cancer. All cells use sugar or glucose to thrive. However, cancer does not necessarily proliferate from eating sugar. The American Institute for Cancer Research states that there is no definitive evidence stating that sugar feeds cancer cells over other cells in the body. This can be hard for some to believe as cancer cells require a massive amount of sugar. Sugar does put you at risk for cancer through weight gain. If you are insulin resistant, then you have a greater amount of IGF, insulin-like growth factor, which is known to help cancer cells grow. Therefore, if you have high blood glucose all the time, that will put you at risk for cancer. This is the same way that it puts you at risk for diabetes. On Wiley Online Library, there's an article by Shan Mugalagam, Bosco, Ridley, and Hemerlich. It's called, Is There a Role for IGF-1 in the Development of Secondary Primary Cancers? They state that IGF-1 is known to stimulate cancer by preventing apoptosis and promoting cancer cell growth. Apoptosis is cell death and is a normal part of the cell cycle. More specifically, apoptosis is programmed cell death and eliminates unwanted cells that are in need of repair or are not functioning properly. To give you an idea of the magnitude and scale of cellular functions, as well as the magnificence of the human body, every day about 50 billion cells are committed to apoptosis. This is the reason why feces are brown. The color comes from dead red blood cells. Apoptosis is part of the routine maintenance that keeps us going. If these abnormal cells stick around, they can lead to problems such as cancer. The abnormal regulation and proliferation of these abnormalities can build anti-apoptosis defenses. The International Journal for Cell Biology has an article by Simone Fulda called Evasion of Apoptosis as a Cellular Stress Response in Cancer. She states that once the apoptosis pathways are altered, they can allow cancer cells to continue to block the pathways and build resistance. This phenomenon of evading apoptosis can be brought on by an increase in the uh, uh, of the IGF hormone, all resulting from elevated blood glucose levels. So it's not only diabetes that we have to worry about, it's cancer as well. Elevated glucose puts such a great stress on the body that inflammation can also play a role. It's obviously better to reduce the risk of all this by simply doing your best to avoid getting type 2 diabetes. We all have to learn and adopt to one principle. We have to eat to live and not live to eat. 
easy to say, but hard to do. But nothing worth it is ever easy. Health problems resulting from too much sugar. There are a plethora of health problems that can develop from eating too much sugar, not to mention the discomfort of walking around with uh, the extra weight. Although not immediate, the detriment that sugar takes on the body can cause a lifetime of health problems. In addition, the health care cost, even with insurance, it would suit people better to gain interest with that money in the bank or funding retirement in the stock market. Excess sugar contributes to visceral adipose tissue, putting strain on joints, the back, and the cardiovascular system. Triglycerides are normal lipids or fats that are found in the blood that accumulate from food. As I said earlier, sugar is not a required nutrient. There is no recommended daily requirement, and excess sugar can prevent triglycerides from breaking down. Sugar can also increase blood pressure by increasing uric acid in the blood, which in turn inhibits nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is vital as it is a natural vasodilator and helps blood vessels to remain flexible and expand when necessary. On the American Diabetes Association website, they have an article by Tessery, Cachette, Kasoma, and others called Nitric Oxide Synthesis is Reduced in Subjects with Type 2 Diabetes and Neuropathy. They conducted a study of diabetic individuals who ate a particular diet for a month, and then their blood was tested, and their results concluded that nitric oxide synthesis decreased under insulin resistance. What this boils down to is the inhibition of a vasodilator unequivocally contributes to cardiovascular disease. What is scary in regard to this is 90% of people with diabetes are overweight, and every year in America, over 1 million people are diagnosed as diabetic each year. What that statistic equates to is that a person is diagnosed with diabetes in the United States every 17 seconds. Additionally, 2 out of every 10 people that have diabetes don't know they have it. There are also grisly things that can happen as a result of complications related to diabetes. Neuropathy can develop where you have tingling or numbness in your feet. Ulcers can develop from small cuts and wounds that someone who is pre-diabetic or diabetic may not feel. This could unfortunately result in an amputation. I have known patients to have a couple of toes cut off and they end up back in the hospital to get another toe or part of the foot amputated somewhere down the line. Those situations unfortunately happen uh, sometimes when diabetes is unregulated or mismanaged. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm stating facts from working in healthcare. Uh, I've had patients that have not taken their blood glucose regulation seriously. I've also seen others who were newly diagnosed and in the early stages decided to lose weight and manage their diabetes with diet and exercise and they turned out perfectly fine. Diabetic retinopathy is a condition where the retina is damaged by excess uh, glucose levels in the blood. When I was in college, we were studying diabetes and we were looking at a video of people who were affected. There was a guy who all of a sudden lost his sight while he was at work. He did not know he was diabetic. He was consuming a number of two liter bottle sodas a day. His wife made his lunch and made sure he had plenty of his favorite soda to take to work and neither of them really thought about the concept of diabetes. He was a big guy and consuming that amount of sugar daily caused him to get bigger. If I recall correctly, he did regain his sight and he and his wife changed their lifestyle since that incident. There are surgical options available, but this condition thankfully is not as common as the CDC states that roughly 4.2 million Americans suffer from diabetic retinopathy. I understand that it's very hard to do as food tastes great and we live in a day and age where everything you can imagine is at your fingertips. You can buy any kind of food literally 24 hours a day. We have national holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas where many of us tend to overeat. We can still do these things, but we have to do them modestly and regulate what we eat in order to not 
overconsume excess sugars, which contribute to weight gain that will ultimately cost, cause us to develop diabetes. Another disease that can arise from too much sugar is tooth decay. It's important to brush and floss regularly. As children, our parents made sure it was driven into our minds, that it was a personal responsibility and it was meticulously adhered to. As adults, we can tend to slack a little bit with our busy lives and responsibilities. Given that there is added sugar to so many foods, that same tenet that we followed as children needs to be adhered to even more as adults and particularly as we age. Over 90% of Americans over the age of 20 in the United States have some type of dental issue. Ways to avoid excess sugar. The primary way to avoiding um, excess sugar is by limiting your sugar intake and reading labels. Sugar is sugar, even if it's organic manuka honey or conventional white sugar. Although manuka honey is a much better choice, it's still sugar. The ideal thing is to cut out as much added sugar as you can because it naturally occurs in foods. Even if you go one week without drinking sugary drinks and replacing that with water, you will notice some weight loss. As I mentioned earlier, sugar can have many names. Reading labels will be a key weapon in limiting sugar. Uh, look for uh, glucose, dextrose, maltose, sucrose, fructose, and lactose to name a few. Revisions have been made to food labeling in the United States and added sugars are included on food labeling. Total sugars is listed and added sugars will be under it. Next to it will be the percentage of a daily value. Finding foods without added sugars or with the lowest amount of added sugars is your best bet. The FDA has made these additions to food labeling in order to, for people to make more informed decisions. So hats off to the FDA on that one. In addition, the FDA states that a label stating that sugar content that is 20% of the daily value is considered high in sugar. There are many foods and beverages to avoid in order to decrease your sugar intake. Avoid fast foods, baked goods, cakes, candy, pies, cookies, ice cream, and sherbet. Don't get me wrong, you can have them throughout the year, but have them in moderation. As for cakes and things like that, um, say limiting that to birthdays or during Christmas and Thanksgiving. Given our culture, that may be taboo to even say limit cakes and pies to those occasions, but if the alternative is a predisposition to diabetes, my recommendation speaks for itself. Don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect, and sometimes it's hard for me to follow my own advice, but it's something that I will continue to work on. Some people try their best to eat healthy, and they select yogurt, which is great, and very good, it's very good for you, and the beneficial bacteria that's in it is great for our intestines. However, you need to read the labels as some yogurts can contain very high amounts of sugar, particularly the ones that have fruits in them or are fruit-flavored blend. The best thing to do is to buy organic non-GMO yogurt, a plain yogurt. Um, you can add fresh fruit to it. Depending on the season, I recommend blueberries, strawberries, kiwis, mangoes, apples, cantaloupe, watermelon, or bananas. As far as bread, some breads tend to be high glyce highly glycemic, so they will spike your blood sugar when consumed. So organic wheat bread, whole wheat bread, is your best option as uh, conventional white bread is highly processed and contains loads of sugars. In addition, whole wheat bread contains a high fiber content that will allow you to feel fuller and is a lower glycemic food in comparison to its traditional counterpart. Other things like sodas and sweetened juice drinks. Many of these juice drinks are from concentrate and contain high amounts of sugar. In addition, many of them contain little to no real juice that you can gain nutrients from. We are essentially drinking a formula of colored sweetened water. To add to that, soda is perhaps the biggest thing to avoid. The amount of high fructose corn syrup, which is very bad for you, is insane. And the ones that have no sugar or a sugar alternative or the diet versions, they are no healthier. 
The thing that I found out about diet sodas or no sugar sodas is that they still taste sweet. They taste like the regular sodas. So when you consume them, your body thinks that it is sugar because your brain recognizes it as sugar and insulin is still secreted to help regulate. So you're not doing anything different. You're simply buying the marketing. Because even though it has zero grams of sugar, your brain and your pancreas still recognize it as sugar and process it the same way. Manufacturers are not being devious or acting in any illegal fashion. It is a personal mission to determine what you're consuming. This is significant because one of the most important things that we can do is to not drink our calories. Substituting water with meals at least two meals a day will be highly beneficial. Condiments like ketchup, spaghetti sauce, marinades, and barbecue sauces have excess sugars. For the sauces I just mentioned, you can make your own. For ketchup, barbecue sauce, and spaghetti sauce, you can combine tomato paste, onions, garlic, ground pepper, and cooking the ingredients. As a thickener, barbecue sauce would require more tomato paste than ketchup and spaghetti sauce, and ketchup would require more tomato paste than spaghetti sauce. There are recipes and videos online that you can look at on how to make your own, and they are quite easy. Canned soup, believe it or not, has a great deal of added sugar as well. Making homemade soup is one of the best small pleasures in life. Whether it's squash soup, or a multi-ingredient chicken soup with dumplings and vegetables, it's much better for you to make your own as there are no excess sugars or processing or preservatives involved. Salad dressings also contain a lot of sugar. They also contain a lot of fat. You can make your own and store it in the refrigerator. What I do is I put mine right on the salad. I pour in a teaspoon of vinegar, a teaspoon of olive oil, a teaspoon of freshly ground pepper, and a pinch of salt. You can make it in a jar if you want to and store it in the fridge, and there are much more elaborate and tasty recipes you can find online for salad dressings, so I advise that you give that a try. Well, that's going to do it for this evening's episode of the Living Healthy Podcast. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for your support. And I'll see you next time. And remember, living healthy creates a better you.